It's a great honor to be here, and I want to thank the English Department and the Humanities Institute. I also want to thank Dan, Melissa, and Isaac for facilitating my trip here and ensuring um, a very rich and um, stimulating workshop this afternoon. Um, I could not have asked for more. Um, okay, so can you all hear me? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to begin with two accounts of the British Empire and African Atlantic experience. The first comes from the eminent black American scholar and activist W.E.B. Du Bois. In his 1899 keynote address to the Negro Academy, titled The Present Outlook for the Dark Races, Du Bois singles out, quote, two events of vast significance to the future of the Negro people, the recapture of Khartoum and the Boer War, end quote. The military action of the English in Sudan and South Africa represent, he contends, the determined attempt to plant English civilization at two centers in the heart of Africa, end quote. Of particular concern to Du Bois is the latter because, he writes, outside of America, the greatest field of contrast between whites and Negroes today is in South Africa, and the situation there should be watched with great interest. For Du Bois, there's no question but that a British victory in the South African War will positively contribute to solving, quote, the greater Negro problem. English rule supports, he argues, the liberal values of non-racial suffrage, higher education, and justice before the law. In contrast to the white supremacist values and practices of Afrikaners and of white America, which Du Bois directly ties to the institutions of slavery. The British Empire then stands to protect black South Africans and Africa more broadly from that enslaved fate. The civilization that the British plant, according to stories such as this one, is supremely literary. The institution of British letters creates a legacy that lasts through the transition to the Commonwealth. The Booker Prize, established in 1969, perfectly symbolizes those associations of British liberalism, literary excellence, and post-imperial largesse. At the ceremony marking his award of the Booker Prize in 1972, however, novelist John Berger decided to tell a different story. Quote, one does not have to be a novelist seeking very subtle connections to trace the five thousand pounds of this prize back to the economic activities from which they came. Booker McConnell have had extensive trading interests in the Caribbean for over 130 years. The modern poverty of the Caribbean is the direct result of this. One of the consequences of this Caribbean poverty is that hundreds of thousands of West Indians have been forced to come to Britain as migrant workers. The Industrial Revolution and the inventions and culture which accompanied it and which created modern Europe was initially financed by the profits from the slave trade. And the fundamental nature of the relationship between Europe and the rest of the world, between black and white, has not changed. Faced with the contradictions of his position, Berger's solution is to initiate reparatory justice. Quote, this is why I intend to share my prize with those West Indians in and from the Caribbean who are fighting to put an end to their exploitation. The London-based Black Panther movement has arisen out of the bones of what bookers and other companies have created in the Caribbean. I want to share this prize with the Black Panther movement because they resist both as black people and as workers uh, to further the exploitation of the oppressed. It's slightly misprinted. The liberal empire for Berger is not slavery's adversary, but its beneficiary. The British metropole, its academies and public institutions took over 30 years to acknowledge his critique. 
and commence systematic exploration of what its material and cultural histories owe to slavery, the messy entanglements of enslavement, capitalism, and liberal ideology. As this new research shows, Berger was uncovering the tip of the iceberg. The legacy of Caribbean slavery lives on not only through the example of the Booker McConnell Company, but also in the extraordinary compensation paid to its plantation owners in 1833 on abolition. About 40% of the UK's treasury, UK Treasury's annual budget was spent then in payouts to slave-owning families that include ancestors of George Orwell, Elizabeth Barrett Browning, and Graham Greene. <sighs> My intention is not to castigate Du Bois for lacking Berger's perspicacity. Du Bois is an impressive testament to the empire's global success in promoting its image as the liberal guardian of humanity. More particularly, though, I want to here emphasize how connected were the experiences of slavery and imperialism in Du Bois's political imagination. What matters more than his questionable perception is the fact that he inserts these two phenomena and their associated countries of South Africa and the United States into a comparative framework. Du Bois was not alone. Black intellectuals across the Oceanic Divide, and most especially in South Africa, were also at this time considering the ideologies and institutional policies of white supremacism and exploring the ways in which their local experiences as subjugated black peoples both overlapped and diverged from those in other continents. It is this international awareness of themselves and their understanding of the global conditions connecting their respective countries, cultures, and histories, conditions that are, are conditions that I refer to as the Black Atlantic. So this phrase, is not a very common one. It's gaining circulation, but um, you're probably more familiar with the Black Atlantic as a formulation, which um, dates from Paul Gilroy's 1993 book, which proposed that cultural historians could take the Atlantic as one single complex unit of analysis in their discussions of the modern world and use it to produce an explicitly transnational and intercultural perspective quoting Gilroy there. Gilroy's work has proved influential and generative across a wide range of disciplines. However, it also promotes an understanding of modern black experience and of modernity itself that privileges the space of the diaspora over that of the continent. In this framework, Africans are not acknowledged agents of the black Atlantic, nor is colonialism credited along with slavery, with playing a constitutive role in Western modern historical development. The 21st century has seen scholars modify and expand Gilroy's paradigms in ways that register African participation as artists, thinkers, and activists in transatlantic exchange. Brent Hayes Edwards' landmark 2003 book the Practice of Diaspora, Literature, Translation, and the Rise of Black Internationalism is one remarkable example. Edwards reveals the considerable complexity of Caribbean, African, and African-American intellectuals' interactions during the interwar years. He showcases their work as journalists, organizers, creative writers, and scholars, painting an account in which all parties are seen as valuable contributors to a textual web of internationalism. Edwards simultaneously points to the asymmetries of power that allowed black Americans to perceive themselves as a global vanguard mandated to lead its colonial brothers to liberation. Important as this work is, it risks restricting our gaze to the operations of African Atlantic culture as it operated within Euro-American capital cities, in particular Paris. In Edward's study, the empire is still writing back to the imperial center, but this time to other diasporic intellectuals who have elected to base themselves within that center. Which is to say that Edward's work ultimately maintains the diasporic spatial bias of Gilroy's, just as it maintains his equation of blackness with a sensibility that seeks, quote, 
to transcend both the structures of the nation state and the constraints of ethnicity and national particularity. Such a framework removes from view several major South African thinkers who maintained strong, maintained strong affiliations to the values of national particularism, notwithstanding their fluid and manifold navigations of African Atlantic life. Although a numerically small demographic, the prolific activity of these thinkers can be overwhelming for the researcher. These were men who established local and national native congresses to lobby white politicians within the metropole as well as colonial administrations, seeking to influence and protest legislation, industrial and educational policy on behalf of colonized peoples. They organized conferences, deputations, and petitions working within constitutional channels to attempt to hold the government to account. One of these, John Dubé, became the first president of the South African Native National Congress in 1912, which was later renamed the African National Congress, or ANC. An important corollary of their organizational labor was their establishment of independent black newspapers, beginning in 1884, when the Eastern Cape journalist John Tango Jabavu broke away from the missionary press journal that employed him to found the weekly Imvo Zabansundu, because of her native opinion. Most of the black activists, in fact, were heavily involved in developing independent news media, which, as Benedict Anderson teaches us, has long been a vital instrument of nationalism. For black South Africans, this press, with its multiple linguistic and regional vectors, generated a diverse po political culture. Scholars who seek to explore this archive need to grapple with the fact that a single newspaper issue may carry ideologically heterogeneous material across the different language sections. The sections in English may reflect a more empire-friendly perspective than those in the African vernacular languages. Or such sections may use their space to monitor and contest the journalism of the white press. Political organization and journalism were intimately connected as newspapers regularly reprinted the speeches, petitions, and official correspondence of their organization's activists. As their comparative exploration of African Atlantic experience increased in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, these intertextual transplantations extended to incorporate writing by black Americans. Likewise, reprinted African speeches and journalism started to circulate more broadly in American publications. These crisscrossings, combinations, and remixes from speech to page, from colony to continent, complicate the material's ideological significance. A text that served an agenda of social accommodation in one context can serve a more critical or utopian agenda when repurposed for a different readership. Altering audiences allowed African Atlantic thinkers to resourcefully diversify their ideas. There is another dimension to African Atlantic writing that has yet to receive its scholarly due, the commercial. When John Dubé, for example, embarked on speaker tours in America in the 1890s, his reasons were as economic as they were ideological. He was raising funds to support himself and his educational initiatives for back home, which means that he needed to customize his arguments to suit the sensibilities of his audience and maximize his financial gain. The researcher needs to consider how far and in what ways the profit motive contributed to African Atlantic textual production. As I hope this suggests, the late Victorian African Atlantic that concerns me here is an intensely self-aware and sophisticated phenomenon, not the unreflective embrace of either black American ideas or British imperial institutions. These thinkers are involved in making strategic and selective affiliations with these outer national entities. Even when they unreservedly invest black Americans with redemptive power, 
or see them as a global racial vanguard and idealize the conditions of life for black diasporan people, these thinkers are often aware that the social realities of US life diverge considerably from their mythic constructions. The same may be said of their occasionally glowing allusions to empire. I want to consider three examples here of African Atlantic exchange that illuminate different dimensions of this complex archive. I've suggested that the independent black press was critical to the development of a nationalism that was as heterogeneous as it was passionate. The role of black American material in this medium was accordingly as complex as the medium itself. My first example is the innovative coverage of Orpheus McAdoo's Virginia Jubilee Choir in John Tango Jababu's Info. This American gospel choir toured South Africa for the first time in 1890, where it received rapturous applause from white and black audiences. At least one journalist, the editor of the Grahamstown Journal, took this opportunity to attack black South Africans for lacking the morality, cultivation, and discipline to make a contribution like the black American performers, whose heritage, that author pointedly remarks, derives from elsewhere in the continent. Praising centuries of US slavery as, quote, not without its beneficial effects in inuring the Negroes to that habit of regular toil, which seems very foreign to the aboriginal African mind, end quote, the author suggests that just such a system of labor would benefit South Africa now. At the same time, a correspondent with the pen name of Dorotili, who wrote in the Koza section of Jabavu's info, saw in these same Jubilee singers an argument for traveling to the US, where black Americans allegedly could enjoy the boundless opportunity of political, economic, social, and cultural uplift. Under the tutelage of this black modern vanguard, black South Africans would, opines Dorotile, become equipped to pursue uplift in their home country. The editorial responses of Jabavu to the contentions by a vicious settler racist and a romantic Pan-African, respectively, are fascinating and creative textual maneuvers. Jabavu uses the English section of his newspaper to refute the Graham Town's journal's racism by reframing it politely. He reprints the toxic original article uncritically and politely surrounds it with news items that attest to recent black progress in the locality, testified by no less than the Secretary of Native Affairs. That he reports on enthusiastic white administrators and on eminent clergy who are promoting the higher education of black South Africans and escorting them to England to that end, this is a rhetorical tactic to diminish settler racism as politically insignificant and ideologically archaic, outweighed by liberal whites working far and wide with blacks to swell the tide of black development. Jababu accompanies this with an editorial on the same page, an enthusiastic uh, performance of his of racial kinship and Pan-African cultural pride that hails the Jubilee Choir as brethren, quote, now visiting this quarter of their fatherland. The choir, he suggests, will inspire further local confidence in the capability of black uplift beyond manual unskilled labor which is exactly, of course, the kind of labor that the Grahamstown Journal is calling for. Um, to counteract English colonial hostility, then, Jabavu claims allyship with both the American choir and with benign white stakeholders in the British Empire, local and metropolitan. His Koza language rejoined her to Dorotile who wants South African natives to take their racial alliance to the next level and travel to America, pursues a different nativist tack. I'm quoting Chibavu here. To go to America, he says, is to eat off the sweat of other men while we lack the courage to do for ourselves. End quote. 
Submission to this kind of African Atlantic sentiment, he suggests, surrenders the ethos of African self-determination altogether, and as such, would prove self-defeating. Black South Africa alone should generate the ground of its future emancipation. He then quotes Francis Bacon and paraphrases him to say that what African Americans have done, we too can do here. Jabavu writes from the Cape province, where adherence to British civilizational norms and alliance with, the local, with local white paternalists was an established protocol for the pursuit of black nationalism. In this context, celebration of pre-colonial black culture or the many 19th century wars of resistance fought by the COSA against British colonial expansion had little place. A very different relationship to pre-colonial history and culture obtains in my next African Atlantic example, John Dubé. Dubé was an energetic and powerful orator who used his 1890s American speaking tours to finance not only his seminary studies in Brooklyn, but also an industrial education school, Olange, which he would successfully establish in Natal in 1901. His audiences and readers included white Midwestern Christians, New York black and white secular communities, black Southerners at the Educational Institutes of Hampton and Tuskegee, Booker T. Washington's flagship. Um, he was extraordinarily widely uh, disseminated in syndicated press. Um, he and his wife, uh, who accompanied him in his second tour, um, and gave occasional interviews to the U.S. press. In other words, these people had a very good sense of PR. Um, so, Dubé attracted the attention of major presses like the New York Times, and his interviews and articles were syndicated across the nation. He also featured in influential missionary journals and in the Southern Workman, an important monthly periodical published by the Hampton Institute. In these touring and publishing ventures, Dubé's writing shifts perspective to enhance his fundraising potential. All the while, he also found ways to advance an idiosyncratic and Afrocentric agenda that fuses Zulu particularism with Ethiopianist generalities. Raised in Natal, Dubé's experience did not lead him to equate the English with liberalism, nor with the agents of missionary Christianity. His primary and secondary education came from Americans, who had had a long established presence in the region through the American Missionary Board. It is not surprising that Dubé would opt for the United States rather than England for advanced academic study and ordination as a minister. His first publication, the 1892 Talk Upon My Native Land, had its origins in an early speech from his teen years in Oberlin in the late 1880s. Within a few months of publication, the talk was revised and reissued under the slightly modified title, A Familiar Talk Upon My Native Land. The revised version, with substantive change in style and contents, reveals just how badly misjudged had been his first edition, which provided missionary press readers an insufficiently deferential and overly cultural nationalist account of pre-Zulu life and land. Dubé now champions, in take two, a socially submissive model of industrial education, disparages black South Africans as heathens, and entertains readers with unflattering ethnographic details of Zulu life. It's important to register the magnitude of these revisions, as well as the Afrocentric pride that underpins Dubé's first foray into African Atlantic textual discourse. As with Invo's account of the Jubilee Singers, the image of a gospel choir serves in his first edition as a crucible for broader claims of black sociocultural development. Dubé's singers usher in a redeemed Africa taking its place on the global stage. Quote, oh, 
How I long for that day when Africa shall take her place as a nation among the nations. Then shall her sons and daughters sing aloud, let us arise and shine, for our light has come. The glory of the Lord has risen upon us. May the day speedily come when Ethiopia shall stretch out her hands unto God. He rounds off his talk with another choral conceit by the missionary poet Walcott. Hail, O Africa, thy ransom, raise to heaven thy grateful song. Last in rank among the nations, thou shalt lead the choral throng. Dubibu Hiles song upon song, quotation upon quotation, to ratify Africa's sanctioned role as a Christian vanguard. His quotation of the phrase, Ethiopia shall stretch out her hands, aligns his mission with the Ethiopianist church, an institution in the US and South Africa that promoted black spiritual autonomy. Dubé also cites Isaiah chapter 60, verse one, arise and shine, which underscores his identification of Africans with ancient Jews as a messianic force entrusted with the power and responsibility of global dominion. Africa becomes Zion, while Dubé becomes the prophet Isaiah. These choral conceits accord with an oral sensibility that runs throughout his first talk, notably in his discussion of the Zulu language is sonically analogous to the European languages most associated with imperial rule. Quote, of all the Bantu languages, authorities recognize the Zulu as being nearest to the original. The beauty and flexibility of the Zulu make it equal to others improved by literature. It is phonetic and harmonious, excepting the three click sounds, which are borrowed from the Hottentots. All the consonantal sounds are like those of English, while the vowels are like Latin, he says. Oral and imperial superiority are interlinked, as are African and European leaders. Describing the great early 19th century Zulu monarch Shaka, whose military achievements created a massive African state, some would say empire, um, Dubé suggests that Shaka, quote, may be compared to Alexander, who wept because there were no more worlds to conquer. The comparison is suggested by the following song, which the Zulu poet is wont to recite on public occasions in honor of Chaka. This beautiful Zulu language, he remarks, is a missionary resource. And he suggests that missionary's greatest achievement to date has been translating the Bible into the Zulu vernacular. His praise is tempered by a critique of those same missionaries' own cognitive linguistic deficits as instructors. Quote, those Europeans who were not familiar with our way of speaking English used to have great difficulty in understanding us. Dubé's amended talk omits all of his oral allusions. The speech now, quote, longs for that day when heathenism shall have been done away with, omits Isaiah, and ends not with a poetic apostrophe to Africa, but instead with a direct appeal to American readers for support. Quote, Thus have I tried by this little rambling talk to give you just an idea of the life of our people, to show you just what is needed. We want earnest men and women to become interested in this people. Here is a work to do. The harvest is ripe. The reapers are few. Do you not hear Christ's question, where are the gleaners? Missionaries are now become the harvesters of black souls. No historic parallels between Zulu and Western culture or empire remain. In their place is his emphasis on the religious and cultural gulf separating heathen Africans from Christianity. If he has replaced Zulu nationalism with evangelical orthodoxy, Dupe, however, does not surrender all his claims to and for black leadership. He argues energetically for the necessity of native, not white, missionaries to exercise African institutional authority. That much could survive the heavy hand of the press's editor. Nonetheless, the image of Africans as crops awaiting cultivation is far removed from the image of a population imbued with sublime vocal power. For 
that population, missionary work is not the making of black souls, but simply the translation of souls into Western audibility. Dibé returned four years later to train at a New York seminary. This arrival coincided with Cecil Rhodes, the prime minister of Cape Colony, and mining magnate arming his chartered company to expropriate African lands north of the Limpopo River in search for gold. It is interesting that Dubé shared his most critical remarks on British imperial expansion, not with his black audiences, but with the predominantly white readership of the New York Times, who were receptive to the contention that Rhodes's civilizing mission was a front for brutal violence and economic predation. There is at present, Dubé writes, a rising of the Matabeles caused by the treatment given to the natives by the English settlers. Rhodes and the other officials of the South African Company may write to England and tell what good they are doing in opening the country to civilization, but we have found by fearful experiences that they are trying to put all they can in their own pockets by killing and plundering us. Already, other tribes are in sympathy with the Matabeles. They are trying to, ex to defend their country from foreign oppressors who are robbing them on every hand. Um, so, fairly unambiguous condemnation there. Uh, uh, however, uh, the bulk of his published speeches and um, exchanges in this new round of American travel were directed at black audiences. Uh, rather than attack empire and remind readers of the new momentum of armed black resistance, his addresses to black audiences promote African Atlantic cooperation and financial support for his Christian educational initiatives. Addressing Hampton, Dubé now revisits his first talk's choral conceit and now puts it into an explicitly international framework, commenting to the Hampton students, when I heard you singing those beautiful melodies tonight, I was held spellbound. Do you ever stop to think that beyond the Atlantic Ocean, there are millions of Africans who, if they were taught the Christian religion, might be singing these same praises to God? A choral global black community is promised under Dubé's moderation, rendering Africans and Americans equal and intertwined participants. Quote, I am glad, he opens his talk with, um, I am glad to have the opportunity to voice the interest of my people, the Africans, in my people, the Afro-Americans. Redefining industrial education now as the idea of self-help the education system inspires Africans, he says, to do these wonderful things which heretofore they had thought only white men could do. American industrial education had been Booker T. Washington's recipe for economic self-sufficiency and political disempowerment. Some scholars consider Dubé as Washington's apostle, but his, his approach differs significantly in his political agenda. Unlike Washington, Dubé proposes an educational system and economic order that allows black South Africans to compete as skilled equals with white labor, and he blasts white missions for their historical failure in South Africa to provide the appropriate schooling for this. Had they done so, quote, the Zulus would today be reaping as much benefit from the land as the white men who are living there. If the revised 1892 talk had presented African souls as the crop awaiting harvest, this new address makes them harvesters who are wrongfully deprived of agricultural development and also implicitly of their patrimonial claim to the nation that they cultivate. The flaws of white missions lead Dubé boldly to now put Christianity itself on probation. Quote, we have our own religion and we think a great deal of it. The only way for Christianity to show us that it is better than our religion is by its works. When all our missionaries can not only preach on Sunday, but can show us on six days of the week how to better our lives, then we will listen to them. 
The spiritual value of Christianity depends upon its realization as economic profit for its African converts, and only an African Atlantic alliance can ensure such an outcome. Quote, I think a few of you might go out and teach as you were taught at Hampton. This would revolutionize the country, for the Zulus are intellectually and physically capable of the highest civilization, but our young men are not allowed to go into the white workshops because we are in the majority, and the whites know that if we are educated as they are, we shall rule the country." End quote. All of this suggests an activist who is less interested in securing a safe place within British imperial polity. Rather, he seeks to establish zones of relative African autonomy that might lay the groundwork for regaining national territorial sovereignty. My third example con concerns Alan Kirkland Soga. The paternalistic liberalism, Cape liberalism, to which Don Tengo Jabavu had selectively subscribed, lost much of its hegemony by the time that Soga became involved with Izwi Labantu, a newspaper founded in 1898 as a, an alternative to Jabavu's own newspaper, Info. George Fredrickson, the late historian, considers Soga as, quote, an unjustly neglected figure and perhaps the most significant and influential African intellectual of the first decade of the 20th century. Soga had aspired to become a high-ranking government servant, a talented administrator trained in law and humanities at Glasgow University. His mother was a white Scottish woman. Um, subsequently, he qualified as a South African attorney. His glass ceiling moment arose when he was transferred to the Colonial Administration's Labor Department, whence he departed altogether from government service. He subsequently redirected his energy to journalism and was instrumental in founding the Cape-based South African Native Congress of 1902, a predecessor to the 1912 ANC. In August 1902, Iswi, published a petition of the Native Congress to Joseph Chamberlain, Britain's Secretary of State for the Colonies. The petition included a lengthy cover letter to the governor of Cape Colony, foregrounding the imperial government's reluctance to allow its black leaders direct access to the Crown government. The Congress can only broadcast its discontent that, quote, under the systems of government obtaining in this colony and in Natal, the intelligence section of the native public has been denied that freedom of utterance and representation which is accorded to His Majesty's other subjects. Their voice is lost amid the ramifications and checks employed by the officials of the Native Affairs Department. The visit of Chamberlain to South Africa later that year prompted is further Iswi and Congress agitation warning that, quote, the extreme anxiety for conciliation, for peace at any price, which has lately been evinced by Mr. Chamberlain and the people of Great Britain, may mean peace at too great a price after all. It's all in the immediate aftermath of the conclusion of South African War. Iswi details their meeting with Cape Premier Gordon Sprigg to request another interview with Chamberlain, Sprigg does his bureaucratic best to discourage them and, again, succeeds in blocking their direct access to the Crown. During this period, the problems of black political communication with imperial authorities are intimately linked with the extension of the black press as a medium for frustrated political opinion. The more that Soga and the Native Congress are frustrated in their efforts to influence colonial policy, and meet with agents of government, the more Iswe assumes an imaginary space as a forum for that constituency. Of particular concern was Clause 8 of the 1902 Peace Treaty, which jeopardized the future of black enfranchisement across the four provinces, now united under white British and Afrikaner rule. Protesting the threatened loss of this civil right, leads Iswi to invoke the U.S. Constitution. Quote, our duty is to urge in the treatment of the native and colored races under federation, the application of the same principles which underlie the 14th and 15th clauses of the Constitution of America. St 
strategic references to American superior electoral, educational, and professional opportunity for black people reflect Soga's attempt to shame white South Africa for betraying its social contract and responsibilities to set black subjects on whose industrial and agrarian labor it depends. In 1903, Soga's Atlantic practices expanded dramatically. He entered into a transatlantic partnership with the Boston-based Colored American Magazine, an extraordinary monthly that, under the editorship of Pauline Hopkins, developed an international concern with the experience of darker races across the modern world. The journal's coverage had followed a similar direction, associating black America with cultural intellectual capital, uh, uh, a familiar vanguardist direction, I should say, associating black America with cultural capital that allowed it a leadership position. However, Soga's initial outreach letter to Hopkins neatly reverses such an assumption by positioning black Americans as the unenlightened subjects in need of South African guidance. Quote, we are sending you a bundle of our paper, Iswi Labantu, from which you will see that the conditions in this country are similar to those existing in the reconstruction days in Southern America. This phrase. After reading the papers, which will give you an insight into the main questions of education, franchise, religion, and tenure conditions, etc., we would be glad if you would communicate with us on any topic on which you require enlightenment. Soga's overture was not only a means to enlist American sympathy and inform readers about South African current affairs, it was also a move to recruit the Colored American magazine as an ally in a media war. And Soga sees both the emergent South African Republic and its press as engaged in war, including battles over image, representation, and national definition, is clear from this letter, which identifies Iswi as one of only two black presses in South Africa and, quote, not yet in a position to combat successfully the phalanx of opposition of the anti-native press in South Africa. His first series for the magazine, named Ethiopians of the 20th Century, reprints three petitions and correspondence that originally circulated in South Africa and were addressed to the imperial administration. Without any preface, Colored American Magazine's first article begins, to the right honorable Joseph Chamberlain, PCMP, his Majesty's secretary of state for the colonies, etc. We are glad of the opportunity afforded us of approaching you and through you the British government in the manner prescribed by the constitutional forms of the country for the expression of public opinion and feeling. By the time that Soga reprints this letter in America, the prescribed constitutional forms had delivered no practical results. The letters are reprinted in the retrospective knowledge of their failure to alter government policy. Their transplantation becomes a protest against the administrative protocols that demand such communications while reserving the right to ignore them. Soga positions his new audience, Black America, in the role of eavesdropper, witness, jury, and an educable family in a revised media campaign for justice. As Black Americans observe Soga's performance as a loyal subject of empire, they also observe the absence of any recorded response from empire's government. This new African Atlantic makes the diaspora an ally in Soga's attempt to delegitimize British rule. His second series for Colored American magazine titled Call the Black Man to Conference extends his critical spotlight now to the United States itself. He doesn't spare black Americans from criticism for lacking appropriate leadership and organization and having um, a chaotic um, disunity in their political struggle, uh, which divides them, limits their credibility, and adds to their vulnerability in a country where white supremacism is in the ascendant, as he sees it. Offering his criticisms, Soga quietly exercises a juridical authority that derives its legitimacy, he suggests, from his continental distance to the squabbling diaspora. Only those black populations who stand outside of America, America's fray can achieve the perspective that prioritizes the global interests of the race as a whole and provide the mechanisms for conflict resolution. The fear 
that black Americans and South Africans are fast approaching what he calls political extinction and virtual slavery, frames call the black man as a series. So does his alarm about, quote, the crushing brutality of mob law, which singles out the Negro as its chief sacrifice. As in South Africa, so in the US, the risk, according to Soga, is that mobocracy will triumph. In order to convey his alarm and imagine a utopian solution, he departs from his rhetorical norm of secular discourse into a visionary discourse of Pan-African transformation, which, like Dubé, makes use of the book of Isaiah, glossing the new Jerusalem the righteous, where the righteous shall inherit the land forever. Quote, the smallest one will become a clan, and the least one a mighty nation. At this point, which is where he basically concludes his series and his relationship to Colored American Magazine, um, Soga's account of black community takes on the contours of an international, sovereign, utopian order which can only exist in the pages of black print culture. So, winding up now, very briefly, I'm suggesting through these three examples that if we, as scholars, want to better understand the British Empire as a national and international phenomenon, as cultural historians and scholars of texts, we need to open our minds to the African Atlantic archive that arose from that continent in order to record, interrogate, and explore that empire. We also need to reckon with the fact that for these African thinkers to grapple with the racial ramifications and policies of imperial rule and to probe their experience as subjects within this expanding empire, it was necessary to grapple with the United States at one and the same time. To confine their inquiry to a single axis of power was a luxury they could not afford. Thank you.